Good morning to um, all of our friends and colleagues here in the United States. Good afternoon and evenings to folks elsewhere. Um, my name is Kasia Malinowska and I direct OSF's uh, Global Draw Policy Program. Uh, we are meeting today with uh, Ernesto Zedillo um, as a part of an effort to highlight 50 years of the war on drugs. Um, and um, if you visit our website, you'll see a series of other events, which I will remind you of uh, at the end. It is a huge privilege to be uh, joined today by uh, President Zedillo, um, who uh, served uh, in Mexico from 1994 to, um, to 2000, and in, uh, is now a director of the Center for uh, Study of Globalization at EIL and also a member of the Global Commission on uh, Drug Policy. Um, questions will be collected by uh, my colleagues at Open Society Foundations and sent our way, so please uh, feel free to post them. And, um, um, and let me start, uh, Ernesto, um, with a question I posed to you a couple of weeks ago uh, when inviting you to, uh, to, to join us. I asked whether you would uh, speak with me um, to sort of mark the 50th anniversary, thinking that June uh, 17th is the date. Um, and you had an interesting response that I would like you to, to share with our audience. Well, uh, what I say, first of all, uh, I am very pleased to join you, Kasia, in this uh, uh, program. And I also take the opportunity to express my appreciation for everything that OSF and you and your team have done uh, to promote uh, more humane and rational policies uh, on drugs. Uh, I think. Uh, what you have done is extremely important. That's the good news. The bad news is that it hasn't been enough. We have to keep doing more because we are still enduring this uh, terrible war on drugs, not only in the United States, not only in my country, not only in the Americas, but in many parts of the world with terrible consequences for humanity at large. Now, that's right, when you told me, well, this is the 50 years of the war of drugs, uh, because there's a landmark day in June uh, 1971 with President Nixon, my answer was, well, actually the war is, uh, uh, is lo much longer than that. Uh, if we talk about Nixon, he was really doing already things that pertain to this war already in 1969. And I know it well because in the fall of 69, uh, as part of this war on drugs that he was already mentioning and announcing, he declared Operation Interception between Mexico and the United States, which caused terrible damage to the economies of both sides of the border. And I know that because my hometown is Mexicali, Mexico which is a border town, the capital city of Baja California. And although I was already a student in Mexico City, I have uh, direct information of the terrible disruption that uh, it was uh, being caused in, 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 in my, my hometown. The disruption was such that uh, after a few weeks, the president, President Nixon, had to backtrack and then he declared Operación Amigo, right? quite a change because the economics sort of impose themselves in this uh, situation. But Nixon was already playing this game in 69. But unfortunately, the story is much longer. As I mentioned to you, the war on drugs really starts uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, in uh, 1909, when the prohibition of opium, opium comes uh, into place in the United States. A few years later, only five years later, the prohibition of cocaine, and a few years later, the prohibition of uh, marijuana. So this is uh, a longer story, uh, which makes it even more absurd, the whole situation. 
because that means that we have evidence that takes uh, longer uh, of one century to prove that this war on drugs is a very bad idea. It has failed. It has been a disaster in every di dimension. It has not served to prevent drug consumption. It has not served uh, any good reason. It has been a total failure. So um, you are a trained economist and have done uh, and have been concerned about developing nations throughout your career. So if you were to if you were to think about sort of most visible uh, damage caused by the war on drugs on developing countries and Latin America more specifically, what would those be? Well, unfortunately. <clears throat> Latin America, and unfortunately, some particular countries in Latin America are exemplary in a negative way of the consequences uh, of the war on drugs, and particularly in the dimension of uh, violence and the dimension of violation of basic human rights. And sadly, and I sincerely say this, uh, one of the worst cases happens to be my own country. In uh, 2006, uh, the war on drugs was uh, accelerated, let's say, uh, to use uh, a mild term, in uh, my own country, in Mexico, and uh, the consequences have been absolutely devastating. Uh, since 2006, <clears throat> the number of homicides, most of them linked uh, to the actions of organized crime and the reaction of the authorities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, organized crime, uh, has caused Mexico, uh, by any conservative estimate, more than 300 thousand people killed. I mean, this is a major war. This is not uh, an incident. Uh, it has caused uh, the displacement of probably, by some accounts, uh, 300,000 people who had to move, uh, you know, fleeing from, from violence. Uh, actually, the life expectancy in Mexico, which is absolutely a fact that is absolutely worrisome and concerning, life expectancy has fallen in Mexico, which is uh, ridiculous, given that now we have better medical elements uh, to extend lives, not to reduce it. However, in Mexico, life expectancy has been falling. And we could go through a very long uh, aspect of everyday life of Mexicans. Uh, which uh, can be observed, can be proven to have deteriorated uh, very significantly because of these uh, drug on words. Uh, perhaps one uh, cost associated to the war on drugs that is not easily measurable, but I think it's evident, is also the deterioration of the capacity of the Mexican state to address other issues, development issues that are quite important for the Mexican uh, population. That is to say, it's not only that there has been a real diversion of resources uh, towards uh, fighting this uh, war on drugs, but also that uh, the institutions, a strong presumption can be established that the institutions, the quality of Mexican institutions, uh, institutions uh, related to the rule of law have been uh, deteriorating significantly since this war was uh, intensified. So the damage to Mexico has been uh, immense. And of course, we could also speak about other dramatic cases, like uh, the case of uh, Colombia, uh, that for many decades was castigated by the violence caused uh, by organized crime on the one hand and by the, these uh, supposedly revolutionary uh, groups. 
that sort of subdued in the early 2000s, but it's still there, and the production of drugs is still uh, there, and as we know, in any moment, the situation could become highly unstable and highly problematic uh, again, as we unfortunately have seen in recent, uh, in recent times. And we could go through practically all of the countries in Latin America, obviously the case of uh, Brazil, the case of Peru, uh, throughout Latin America, Central America has been uh, a dramatic tragedy, all the violence that we see in, in Central America, uh, somehow to a significant extent is associated to the action of uh, organized crime. And organized crime uh, is feeded, is created, is engineered actually by uh, drug policies uh, in our countries. So the consequences are devastating, Kasia. Um. Thank you. Thanks for this analysis. The first time I think I heard you speak about uh, about drug uh, drug policy. I mean, in, in my in my mind, this may be accurate or not, but but I sort of saw what I felt was your coming out as a drug policy reformer at an event held by the Global Commission over a decade ago. I think it was it was at MoMA where you you were the keynote address and i must say i sat in the chair just mesmerized by your analysis because i thought it was so incredibly clear and bright and it articulated drug regulation legalization as something that countries need to consider in order to in order to to sort of yeah shift us away from the current paradigm but that's an incredible ask. That's a huge political ask. So how do you, what do you think are the prospects for governments actually listening and paying attention to, to that? Well, the prospects, I don't know, because, you know, sometimes we get uh, positive signals uh, that unfortunately do not uh, materialize in serious uh, reforms that has happened in many places uh, in uh, in the world. Uh, now, uh, how you sort of suggest that there has been a switch? You know, I think what we have had is uh, an evolution uh, in our analysis and our thinking, not only of me but the other people you know that are involved in the global commission. Perhaps we should, uh, I should make a, you know, a brief uh, uh, story or brief history of how this process has been with the, with the global commission on drug policy. In 2008, uh, three former Latin American presidents, uh, President Cardoso of Brazil, President Gabiri of Colombia and myself, decided to come together and uh, under the chairmanship of President Cardoso, uh, the Commission on Drugs and Democracy in Latin America was created. Uh, a number of distinguished individuals were conveyed in that uh, commission. Uh, we were, of course, very worried with what had started to happen, what, with what had happened in Colombia in past years and what was beginning to happen in countries uh, like Mexico and Brazil and others in Latin America. If you read today our report, uh, which was published early in 2009, you would say, well, this sounds a little bit uh, naive and probably insufficiently bold and, and uh, ambitious. But it was just the beginning. Um, because uh, out of that report, I think we were able to stir up some consciences, not least, uh, I think, uh, our voice was heard, for example, at the Organization of American States, where they produced a document which was really unprecedented. And <clears throat> then there was this uh, meeting summit of the Americas in Cartagena, where President Obama attended, and the declaration of this summit actually included 
uh, a section on on this question. And uh, what they said there, the mandatories, was uh, truly unprecedented. Uh, for the first time, uh, this more holistic uh, view of the problem was articulated, and there were some suggestions that there will be an opening towards other ideas. Uh, that really encourages to keep going. Uh, and that's why the Global Commission was created, uh, again, under the uh, highly skillful uh, chairmanship of uh, President Cardoso. This time around, we conveyed uh, people from all over the world. Fortunately, we had the support of uh, uh, the Open Society Foundation, um, of yourself, uh, for this uh, endeavor. And again, you see the various reports. We produce a report in 2011, a produce a report on 2014. And as we gather more evidence of how terrible this thing was uh, in light of the current circumstances at the time, we decided that we needed to be more, let's say, to be bolder, uh, not only on our analysis, but also on our prescriptions. And finally, we produce uh, the 2018 report that, by the way, was presented in, in Mexico City in the fall of 2018. I think uh, for sure you were there. And I think the pieces came together. We had uh, in our first report spoken about decriminalization of uh, consumption. Uh, in our 2014 report, we were pointing uh, very clearly that, uh, well, decriminalizing consumption was, of course, uh, unnecessary, but not a sufficient condition, because then who is going to provide uh, 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 the elements for the consumption? Those cannot be live in the hands the, of organized crime. And I think in the 2018 report presented in Mexico, all the pieces uh, came together and said, okay, we have to go for decriminalizing consumption and for a strong, intelligent, well-planned regulation on the supply side. And this applies for all drugs, not only for uh, cannabis. So I think now we have uh, an intellectual framework, you know, to think about the drug problem and an intellectual framework to be applied to produce very concrete uh, policy prescriptions. In fact, as we were working on the report of the Global Commission uh, conveyed by my own center here at Yale University. Uh, I asked uh, some Mexican scholars uh, to come and work uh, with me, and we produced a paper, a policy paper on, on, Me on Mexico, where basically the same elements that were being uh, put forward in the global report were applied to the Mexican case. And this is all to say that uh, we, it is not that we don't know what to do. I think now we have clarity about how to go about this problem. But of course, we need the political will. We need the vision. Uh, we need leaders, political leaders that say, OK, probably what uh, I'm going to propose politically short term is not uh, popular. But my responsibility is uh, uh, to see uh, for the good uh, of society at large, and therefore we have to speak of a different approach to deal with the drug problems, because now we have evidence that what we are doing is a total failure, which is exactly the case. So, so let, let's stop here for a second and talk about the political will. You said that uh, things became a lot more complex and violence increased in Mexico around starting around 2006. And that, of course, is when President Calderon took office and when he basically declared his own version, Mexican version of the war on drugs. Now, uh, in Colombia, we had a different story where President Santos was actually making quiet, articulate uh, plea for change of, uh, of uh, drug policy in his own country, for change of relationship between the United States and Colombia, and what is being funded by the U.S. in his own country. 
And so it's actually quite, when you look at drug policy and attempt to change it one way or the other, it's actually quite, the outcomes are actually quite significant. And so is there, and it's, it's amazing how actually easy it is to go from one extreme to the other, because what the winds of Colombia are no longer there, of course, when the government changed. And so President Calderon came in and really sort of, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it seems like introduced somewhat of a nuclear option of how to deal with drugs in Mexico. So, so how do we, how do we, how do we as sort of social, uh, civil society actors, academics, how do we stay on course? in an environment where one, when, when the will of one politician can actually skew um, what happens in, in a given country. And I think those Colombia and Mexico are actually good, excellent examples of how just the process of elections and either undermines progress or actually, or actually puts the country on course uh, that Mexico is on right now. Well, uh, first of all, and you know, and I am here not to be uh, a defender of uh, anybody, certainly not of uh, President Calderon, but to be fair, we have to say that uh, President Calderon's decision were not taken in a vacuum. I think uh, it had become evident that uh, drug trafficking uh, was uh, becoming more pervasive in the early years uh, of the century in Mexico, that there was uh, increasing violence, and that there were some parts of the Mexican territory that were uh, suffering uh, a lot because of this increase uh, in the activities of organized crime. Uh, and uh, the governors of some of these uh, states uh, were asking the federal government uh, to use the instruments at their disposal to, uh, to take action. Uh, and I think the, the case you mentioned is very interesting because uh, where President Calderon sent a uh, more uh, robust presence of the army was in the state of uh, Michoacán. Uh, and the governor of the state of Michoacán was asking the federal government uh, to be more aggressive in fighting this. Uh, and it was uh, Mr. Cárdenas, uh, the governor, and Mr. Cárdenas happens to be today the chief of staff of the current president of Mexico. So, so, so this is, you know, real people with real responsibility uh, saying, okay, we have a problem. What are the legal instruments we have at our disposal? We have a framework within which a constitutional uh, framework, legal framework, at least the one they believe uh, should address this uh, problem. And, uh, and they use it. But now we know, we have the evidence that by moving within those constraints that uh, at least uh, in their perception, uh, the Mexican state uh, has to move, uh, the consequences have been a disaster. So we could uh, make an argument that uh, President Calderon uh, did what he should do and could do under those circumstances. But I think after the evidence accumulated for 14 years, uh, it is not uh, or it is highly questionable to stick to that uh, strategy. And I think this is uh, very important. Now we know better than repression, uh, violence, uh, the application of criminal laws is wrong to deal with the problem. It's not solving the problem. It's creating a bigger problem. 
now we know we have the hard evidence so it is highly questionable to keep on the same track or even worse uh, making it uh, deeper given the evidence that we have uh, brutally in front of us and so so i think a similar story repeats itself elsewhere when when i began a conversation with president kwasniewski who is my my president in poland about the decision that he had taken in 2000. It was actually a decision to criminalize possession in Poland. The data has showed that it was young people that suffered and that the sort of larger outcome that he was uh, hoping for were not uh, accomplished. So so what needs to happen? What needs to happen for, for, um, for policymakers, politicians, uh, what needs to happen for that switch to actually be recognized the moment where enough data has been created and and for things to for for shifts to take place i mean in the united states we've collected 50 years of that data right and and one can argue that yes there is some softening uh, in the us uh, but we're far from where we would want you want the us to be so what are the necessary moments in time that might inspire change? Well, I think we have to go back uh, uh, to basic uh, questions. And uh, for me, the basic uh, question is, uh, you know, being uh, an student of how to do uh, policies, economic and and social uh, policies, well, the first step uh, is to say, okay, what is that uh, the best knowledge? Uh, what is the analysis that can be provided by best knowledge? And what is the analysis that can be uh, supported uh, by evidence? Uh, I think that's uh, the first step, you know, to acquire clarity. Uh, on the diagnosis based on best knowledge and on best uh, evidence, on best reasoning and best uh, evidence. Uh, and I think uh, in the case of drug policy, it is evident that the existing policies betray uh, that best knowledge. It's against essential logic provided certainly by my discipline, economics, uh, but also by life sciences. Everything that we know about uh, medicine, everything that we know about public health, and that's your degree on, on public health, runs against uh, the existing policy. Uh, and you also review the history of how policies were designed, even at that moment, uh, there was a clarity uh, from the part of people who knew better that the policies were, were being poorly designed. I'm talking about the case of the United States and certainly of uh, my country. Uh, so that leads to a bigger question. Can we really tweak the present approach uh, of policy to get to the right place. And I think this has been my strong uh, conclusion after all these years. My answer is no. We really have to discard uh, this paradigm and look for a totally different paradigm uh, in which uh, the issue of uh, drugs is uh, fundamentally dealt as a health issue, as a human rights issue, and not as a criminal issue. And if we do that, we are going to produce uh, an outcome that uh, will not sustain organized crime and all its violence and corruption, as it has been uh, the case uh, until now. So we have to talk to our political leaders and say, you know, you have to admit that uh, this is uh, wrong, uh, that this has not fixed uh, what you wanted uh, to fix, and uh, please sit down and consider. 
a totally different uh, approach to deal with this uh, issue. I think uh, the approaches that had been attempted that really try to work on the margins of the problem, including the harm reduction approach, I think they are not working uh, to the extent needed, and they will not work. Uh, so we have to go for a model that uh, emphasizes fundamentally the criminalization of consumption and regulation of supply. Well, that sounds um, like uh, a difficult task. However, let me make uh, a claim. It shouldn't be such a difficult task. And I say that because we have continued to analyze uh, the Mexican case uh, carefully. And what we have found, and it was already uh, present in our 2018 study, is that the Mexican drug policy based on prohibition uh, brutally uh, violates uh, other constitutional provisions in the Mexican constitution. Uh, and that, uh, therefore, the prohibition policy uh, should be abolished by the simple fact that it is in blatant contradiction of more fundamental rights established, rights and responsibilities established in the Mexican Constitution. Uh, and I think that's a very important uh, conclusion, because that should be the banner, that should be the way to go, uh, to show before the courts, before the executive branch, before the legis legislative branch of our government, that uh, the prohibition policy is wrong, and therefore those uh, branches of government have a responsibility to discard the prohibition policy and to work seriously uh, in a different framework to approach uh, or to develop uh, a policy for this problem. So, so, so let's let, let's talk about Mexico. So that's a that's a bold claim, and and I think that's a very coherent claim that drug laws actually violate prohibition, as you say, violate constitution. Uh, and so Mexico is is now in a conversation about cannabis regulation, where Supreme Court has spoken. So can you talk a bit about that? Well, and I think uh, what has happened in Mexico, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, is very important because the Supreme Court has said, you know, the uh, current uh, cannabis uh, uh, laws violate the Constitution. Uh, this blanket prohibition that practically exists is unconstitutional for reasons that have been expressed by the Mexican Supreme Court. I believe there are other reasons important that I hope in due time are considered by our Supreme Court. Uh, but, uh, and that's a good news. The bad news is that our Congress was uh, instructed by the Supreme Court to adjust the Mexican laws to eliminate uh, this uh, anomalous situation. Uh, the, our Congress had been given a date uh, in 2019 as a deadline, I think September 2019, and to this day our Congress has not uh, carried out uh, the legislation uh, that is supposed to, to carry out. And I don't really know what's the position of the executive branch of, uh, of government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this uh, ruling of the Supreme Court. But I would say this is just the beginning because everything that we are saying is not limited to the case of cannabis. Uh, what we are talking about is a general policy. And I would say the more dangerous a drug uh, is, the bigger the responsibility of the state, the Mexican state or any state, to regulate uh, drugs. Uh, so I would say that uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court that certainly should be obeyed by our other branches uh, of government uh, is just the beginning of something that I hope one day will be the full regulation 
of drugs in Mexico, not prohibition, regulation, which is different. Understood, understood. I mean, that, that, is, a, that is a dramatic change of the framing, and I think it's that dramatic change of the framing that most, I mean, at, at the current state, at the current moment, I think states are honestly terrified of. Uh, and and so, so I think how this discussion moves, uh, how this discussion moves will be very interesting uh, to observe. Now, you've made a point about harm reduction, about incremental change not being good enough. Um, and as, as you said, I'm a public health uh, professional, so let me defend harm reduction, because I think harm reduction is incredibly effective. It's just not, I think what, what ends up happening is that prohibition gets in the way, because I think the services that are being offered to people who use drugs are incredibly effective, and people do take them up and do want them. So I think the question is not whether harm reduction is effective. The question is whether the current environment as it exists now, the environment of prohibition, actually gets in a way of harm reduction sort of fulfilling its greatest potential. And so, and I, I think we have those examples repeatedly in other spaces as well. Why would, you know, in the United States, why would a, a, a young mother uh, show up to a needle exchange program if she knows that she risks her children being taken away by self-identifying as a drug user, right? So it's not a question of quality of, it's not a question of the service that's being provided, it's a question of, um, of uh, legislative framing in which she functions. And so, so I agree with you very much that the sort of incremental change is not good enough and that what we need to think about is in fact taking on the entire sort of prohibitionist structure so harm reduction can thrive, so good quality drug treatment can thrive, so good uh, drug education can thrive. But it's not a matter of, you know, one not working. I think it's not given a chance to work. In a current total agreement i think we are talking about two different things kasha uh, when i made reference and perhaps it is my fault for not explaining it better uh, when i made reference to harm reduction i was making reference uh, to the position taken by some people to say okay let us work within the existing framework uh, within the existing policies uh, but let us put together, you know, harm reduction strategies uh, to reduce to the extent possible the damage caused by the present policy. Well, that's uh, my, my concern. Uh, I think uh, harm reduction certainly has to be part of a rational public health strategy, as well as prevention, as well as the provision of many other, uh, let's say, health services uh, to deal with the, with the problem. But it cannot be, let's say, uh, something to support existing policies, because existing policies are wrong. I think harm reduction from a medical perspective, from a medical public health uh, uh, perspective, is indispensable. Because as we know, there will always be people no matter how intelligent your prevention is, that will consume drugs. And in some cases, you want to support those people to deal with their addiction, right? Because you want them to be uh, engaged, uh, useful, productive uh, members of the society. And they happen to have a medical condition, which is addiction, and therefore, you need strategies to support them to function in, in society. From that perspective, we are in total agreement. What I reject is the idea that, okay, you do a lot of harm reduction and that's it. No, I want to discard uh, prohibition and, of course, invest the money, center uh, the effort on people to support people either to prevent uh, because there are some drugs which are very dangerous, people should not uh, have them, but uh, you have to convince them by prevention 
or if people have fallen into addiction, you know, to support them to function normally in society. So, so if we, so if incremental approach is, in your view, not going to get us to where we need to go, then um, we have a problem with the U.S. again, because U.S. is exporting drug courts, diversion programs, right? If you if you look at the programs that are now being funded or supported from U.S. embassies throughout Latin America, what you will see is the sort of kinder, softer war on drugs, right? And and again, unwillingness to tackle prohibition as as the issue. Now, what what space do you think exists in Latin America to actually tell the U.S. that that's not needed, that that's not what you need funding for, that this is not the advice that you need, that you know INL well, yeah. is not what is needed in your countries. Yeah, we are having some problems of communication. I, I will lose you. Well, well, I think uh, we have to, in this case, uh, and we Latin Americans like uh, to speak because we believe in our national sovereignty uh, and to exercise that national sovereignty even more so when we believe it's in the interest uh, of our own uh, people. And I think in the case of uh, dealing with the drug problem and dealing with the problems that have been brought about by organized crime, who are the beneficiaries of the state's uh, uh, drug policies, uh, we have to exercise our own national sovereignty uh, but as I said before, we have a, a very good point of advantage, and that is that the drugs policies that we are practicing, at least I am absolutely convinced in the case of, of Mexico, run against other more important provisions in our constitution. Uh, and actually, the fact that we are committed and we are active part of the three international conventions on drugs is in violation of the Mexican constitution because we are, among others, violating the right to health and many other rights that are stipulated in our, in our constitution. So I would say that we have a sound legal basis. Uh, to say we have to change become friends uh, and say, listen, what uh, we have been doing together, I cannot continue to do the way we have done it uh, because it's in violation of our constitution. And the Mexican state acknowledges that and therefore will build, uh, will produce a, a different kind of policy. Uh, and I am sorry. And of course, you have your own drug problem. It's up to you to deal with the problem the way you want. Uh, and of course, we can do an agreement, a strong agreement, much stronger agreement on interdiction. You know, do whatever is physically possible, uh, which we know is not too much, uh, to prevent uh, the passing of drugs into your territory. And by the way, I would put a footnote and think about the policy that you have pursued for over a hundred years, and it seems to be uh, failing. Uh, and this, uh, for this, we have not only <clears throat> objective indicators, uh, which is what has happened with consumption of drugs in the United States, uh, which evidently has not achieved what it was purported to achieve. It has created other dramatic social and economic uh, consequences. And by the way, you yourself are now recognizing that it is a failure. And why do I say this? Because you have a number, a large number of uh, US states where they had proceeded uh, to legalize or decriminalize the consumption and the production of uh, cannabis. 
uh, and you, federal government, uh, simply are turning your head to the other side. Uh, you claim to have a legal obligation uh, to apply the federal laws, but you are not applying the federal laws. So I, I suspect there must be a very pragmatic uh, reason, and the pragmatic reason is simply that your policy, your federal policy, is wrong. So please consider to stop playing this game of organized hype and recognize that the foundations of your policy are very wrong. And please, uh, let's agree that I will do my own policy uh, and that we will continue to be, you know, good neighbors, good friends, and work together on many other endeavors. And to the extent possible, we'll keep working on this uh, uh, together on the drug problem, but not under the uh, terms that you have for a hundred years. Okay, well, that's that's a very clear that's a very clear message. Very clear message to the U.S. Um, uh, and y you mentioned the three. You mentioned the three conventions. Um, uh, as as countries are experimenting, as countries are experimenting with shifting their drug policies, they are arguing. I mean, Canada argues that while it legalized cannabis at a federal level, it it actually is in compliance with the UN Convention. Uh, Uruguay made a similar case, right? That basically, while they uh, legalized cannabis, they still are full signatories to the conventions. Is there a, how do we wrap our head around ending prohibition? Well, I applaud, I and applaud, uh, you know, what Canada and Uruguay have done. But let us be clear. You no, know, of course they are in violation of uh, international covenant. Nevertheless, they decided to go ahead because it's in their interest of their people to have these uh, more uh, rational uh, policies. But uh, they also decided to say, oh, we are in compliance with uh, the conventions. Um, I think this is uh, one more example of uh, organized hypocrisy. I hope uh, one day Canada, uh, as well as Uruguay, say, you know, yes, uh, we, we are not, because being in compliance uh, is inconsistent with uh, other objectives and uh, other stipulations in our own laws. And therefore, some laws, uh, between local laws, national laws, and international laws. There are tensions, uh, as it is evident in the Mexican case, uh, between some constitutional precepts, as that, uh, for example, those from which stem uh, the criminal prohibition laws. Well, you have to take a decision, and this is up to the legal scholars, you know, what is the hierarchy of these uh, covenants? And I would say uh, human rights, uh, fundamental human rights, should be the essential criteria to decide, you know, what go or above uh, the action of the state. And if that is the case, then I think we have to admit that the conventions are wrong and that uh, certainly at the national level is wrong. Okay. And so if you were, if you were, um, if you were to sort of draw a, yeah, if, if you were to walk us through what in your view is possible, in the next 20 years, in terms of countries, regions, uh, multilateral agencies, um, where the pressure points, uh, where governments, advocates should be focusing on, what would be your advice? Again, in sort of mid-term goal of, let's say, yeah, or long-term goal 
between, let's say, 10 to 20 years? Well, <laughs> I have to be honest and say I don't know. You know, uh, when I was uh, in government, uh, at least from the perspective of economic reasoning, I knew that uh, the framework uh, was wrong uh, because basically we knew that uh, by prohibiting something that anyways uh, will be demanded in the marketplace, we were creating a black market. And we know that black markets uh, are supplied by individuals or organizations that are willing to violate the law. Uh, however, we still believe that by making some uh, adjustments, a combination of, uh, let's say, positive and negative incentives, we will sort of produce uh, a second best uh, approach to deal with the problem and allow Mexico to uh, keep complying with uh, the commitments that had been taken in the past since the, the 1961 uh, convention. However, we were pushing for a change in thinking and that's why Mexico uh, in 1997 work uh, very actively to have uh, a special session of the UN General Assembly to discuss in the General Assembly the drug problem. Mexico was the promoter of that. I was uh, then uh, presi presiding the Mexican uh, government. Uh, we had the special session and frankly, other than a change of language, that made the big powers admit that they were part of the problem because of their consumption, nothing significant was uh, achieved. So I was uh, frustrated by the outcome of that special session that Mexico and certainly also with the support of Portugal. By the way, the prime minister of Portugal at the time uh, who supported uh, the idea was Antonio Guterres, now UN Secretary uh, General. Mexico and Portugal were, let's say, the champions of promoting that. Uh, but frankly, uh, it was a failure. Uh, nice uh, language, uh, you know, nice attendance, nice uh, speeches, nothing happened. We have to wait 18 years to have another special session. Also requested, and, um, also requested by Mexico, yes? Along and with certainly the... by President Calderón. By the way, President Calderón was idea, along with uh, Guatemala and, and other Latin American countries, Colombia. Uh, and uh, I was, as many of you were, very excited that something significant could happen in that uh, special session. Uh, however, a few months before the special session was due to take place, it was clear to me that uh, nothing really other than good speeches uh, will be produced uh, at that uh, meeting, uh, not least because uh, it was evident that the United States uh, had already uh, form an alliance uh, to, you know, to get uh, not the results that should have been expected. And unfortunately, there are times when one hates to be right. And I wrote that, you know, this is not a saying. I wrote an article for a book that was uh, being edited by Richard Branson, where I predicted, you know, is thing, if things are as proof as they are now, uh, I was writing that in 2015, the special session is going to be a failure. And of course, I was very disappointed uh, to be proven uh, right. So I don't really know. I think uh, what uh, must be done is to work uh, strongly in certain countries. I wish this were the case in, in my own country, 
uh, not because it's my country, which is important, of course, very important for me, but also because this is one of the countries that is suffering the most, uh, the war on drugs. Okay, so no, no, no advice to us as advocates, no advice to academics. In no, terms there is a very concrete advice. Eh? Eh, go for the whole thing, eh, really. Eh, start looking at programs and projects where the total legality of prohibition is questioned. Eh, start fighting that in the tribunals. Go up to the constitutional court to say this is in violation of uh, essential human rights. This is in violation of the obligation of the state to comply with other responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, citizens. I think we have to be louder. Of course, we have to be rational. We have to be intelligent. We have to provide the arguments. This is not a, a, a rhetorical question. That's why my own center has invested resources uh, to have scholars, uh, legal scholars, thinking hard about uh, these arguments. So when I speak uh, like this, it's not that I am having an occurrence, you know, just because in the morning or in the night an idea came to my mind. Uh, when I say this, uh, with this conviction, is because I am trust, trusting those who have dedicated their life uh, to study the law, to study the Mexican Constitution, to study the conventions, and they have come to the conclusion that this is uh, wrong, not only for the reasons that we, the economy, say it is wrongly the reasons uh, for which uh, that uh, somebody like Kasha, who knows a lot about uh, uh, public health, having got a PhD from Colombia, uh, says, but because they have studied the law and have concluded. So we, let's go for all of it. Great, great, great. I, I, lo I, loved, I love that clarity. Thank you for that. We have some questions from uh, from folks that are on the other side, and one of them is: you talked a bit about the UN, and we're not um, uh, we're not too optimistic. What about regional bodies, um, Organization of American States? Do you think that there is there's some hope at a regional level? Well, the, that countries can well, the Organization of American States had started had started, you know, very significant uh, effort uh, uh, some years ago, uh, but they sort of lost momentum. And of course, I'm not surprised because uh, after the Obama administration, we had the Trump uh, administration and, and everything on this and many other aspects of international cooperation. Uh, was hopeless with that uh, administration. Uh, it seemed to be like a central endeavor of uh, the Trump administration to destroy uh, international cooperation and to destroy multilateral institutions. Uh, so we sort of uh, lost some time. I just hope that uh, the new American administration at some point, I understand they have their own respectable domestic uh, agenda, uh, but I think as part of that domestic agenda, they should be concerned uh, about uh, the cost of their drug policies and start reviewing seriously uh, what uh, the American government has done traditionally, taking into account certainly first and foremost the national effects of that policy in the U.S., but also the effects that uh, those policies have had in other country, countries, including uh, my own country and other Latin American countries. Now, do you, do you think, do you expect that U.S. domination in sort of 
drug policy is going to continue? Or do you think that there's space for other countries to step up and um, and and take on that leadership? Well, uh, not really at this point, uh, because, you know, if you think about Europe, you have some countries uh, in Europe that have shown uh, enlightenment uh, on this uh, issue. But uh, the European Union as a whole uh, doesn't uh, seem to be interested in pursuing a European uh, policy. This is not a field in which they want to do a unified uh, and rational policy. Uh, among other reasons, because some powerful members of the European Union, like France, uh, doesn't seem to be willing to have a more enlightened uh, policy on the matter. But I insist there are some countries, uh, uh, like Portugal or uh, the Netherlands, who in some aspects have run experiments that have proven that prohibition is wrong and that uh, decriminalization uh, is right, although, you know, they haven't gone to, uh, all the way to, to proper uh, regulation. Uh, so I think the UK is uh, a promising case. We have seen, you know, attempts to move forward, but uh, I think they are still off the mark. Uh, and then you have uh, cases, you know, like uh, Russia, which is totally obstructionist uh, uh, and uh, their uh, laws and their way to deal of, I would say, and I, I hope they don't get uh, offended, highly supportive of the United States uh, position. And uh, in the emerging countries, I think you also see in Asia, certainly in South Asia, uh, in North Africa, where they simply oppose any idea of uh, modernization of these policies. So I would be, let's say, if there is a region where change could happen or should happen, it's Latin America. Why? Because we have suffered the most. Because we have the evidence, right? And because maybe we have a chance to contribute at least uh, marginally uh, to conference that what they ask us to do and they have doing for themselves is totally wrong. So, so Ernesto, um, let's go back to Mexico uh, as an end. Um, there was a lot of hope. Uh, about the current administration um, committing itself to, to cannabis regulation. Um, there was also a lot of hope in the beginning that actually the, the issue of demilitarization of police is going to be uh, what the government pursues. That's not where things landed with the National, with the national Guard. Um, can you talk a bit about what you see as a future of, of Mexican drug policy um, uh, over, the, over the next couple of years. Uh, there, as you know, the number of passionate advocates who are uh, pushing that agenda forward uh, with some disappointment. Uh, what are sort of your words of experience and wisdom to, to them all? Well, uh, first, uh, I don't give advice. I have opinion. What is right. your opinion? <laughs> uh, I haven't yet heard. I haven't heard yet because you say there was hope about this government. Uh, I think uh, I, I don't know of any, let's say, formal positioning of the head of the executive branch of government uh, on this issue. Uh, not before, not now. Uh, I know that uh, some members of uh, the government uh, at some point uh, have expressed uh, progressive uh, positions. Uh, I can tell you, because probably it's not a secret, that back in 2018, uh, when uh, the Global Commission 
was meeting in Mexico. Uh, we were kindly uh, offered or had a meeting with a number of members of Congress from all parties where uh, uh, the chair of the Global Commission uh, presented uh, our global report. Yep. Uh, and actually, the chair of the Global Commission, Madame Dreyfus, uh, asked uh, me to give copy of uh, the report uh, that I had been working with some Mexican colleagues that we were about to present uh, publicly in Mexico City. Uh, and uh, from the reaction I had from that group of uh, members of Congress, uh, I was encouraged because uh, I heard, I saw open mind and there were representatives for, from all parties uh, in the Mexican Congress. I saw a group uh, and it was not a too small group, it was a rather large group. I saw a group which uh, seemed to have open mind. So at that moment I was uh, a bit uh, optimistic, you know, because I made a, a brief but bold presentation, uh, more or less in the same terms that I have uh, spoken to you uh, today. And the reaction was uh, positive. I'm not saying that they approve or anything like that. They just listened and received uh, in very courteous way what we were giving them in terms of the global report and the Mexican uh, document, uh, but uh, the fact that uh, to this day the Mexican Congress has not complied with the ruling of the Supreme Court uh, makes me uh, very concerned. So I don't see yet uh, a path forward uh, towards a comprehensive reform. Uh, of course, I wish uh, our government, my government, uh, took uh, that route, but I don't still see that route. So I would be lying if I told you, oh, yes, uh, it's going to happen. I don't okay. see yet evidence of that happening. Okay, so more work needed. Yes, more more work needed. So um, let me, let, let's stop here and let me just express huge gratitude for the clarity of mind that you are sharing with us because you know a lot, uh, w there's a lot th there are a lot of leaders that are willing to talk about drug policy reform in terms of as you call it changes on the margins but i think naming the problem where it really is and naming prohibition as the problem is an incredible contribution that you've made to to the field of drug policy. You, along with your colleagues uh, in in the commission, and so having that voice, I think, gives all of us more on the ground something very important to um, to um, to articulate to our governments, our colleagues, uh, spaces that we that we work in. So, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for that clarity of mind. Um, and um, yeah, I, I look forward to I look forward to learning from uh, from from you and others in uh, in this space of leadership. Um, and really hoping that there will be more and more senior um, senior uh, politicians, former politicians that take on this agenda. Because as, as sort of we think at OSF uh, of the work that we've done to date, the group continues to be small, and I think there needs to be a lot more of us uh, at the global at the global level, at the uh, at the national level, at community level, um, and that's that's what uh, I hope the next decade brings. That the lessons learned that have been articulated and the policy framings that have been articulated will get picked up, but by much broader um, broader groups of, uh, of people. Um, so this is not tinkering on the edges, but it becomes a mainstream discussion um, uh, as we go into 60th year of the 
failed the war on drugs, unfortunately. Well, as we leave the second century of the war on drugs, <laughs> as I am claiming. No, uh, Kasia, uh, you are very generous. Uh, it is uh, me who wants to express uh, my deepest gratitude uh, to the work that OSF and you and your team have been doing over uh, so many years uh, to promote uh, more humane, more rational, I would say legal policies uh, on drug policy. I think uh, without the work uh, and the support of OSF, uh, we will still be even farther behind in this uh, struggle, which is a very important struggle. I repeat, you know, when you speak in Mexico of uh, more than 300,000 people killed uh, in the last uh, 15 years uh, because of the war on drugs, this is not a minor event. When you think about uh, the children, who have lost uh, their parents. When uh, you think about the people who have been displaced from their home, when you think about parents who think of their children going out and not knowing whether they will be back because they will be uh, caught in an act uh, of violence, wherever they are. Uh, when you think of a country that has seen its uh, life expectancy reduce in the 21st century, it's something incredible. Uh, so this is a real human uh, suffering we are dealing with. And therefore, the fact that there are organizations like OSF uh, that are saying, you know, let's think about this problem, let's use uh, good knowledge to analyze the existing policy and to think about uh, new ways uh, to deal with the problem, uh, it is uh, you who deserve uh, our gratitude for this uh, amazing effort. And that is something that truly commits uh, people like me and my colleagues, uh, not at my center, but in many other places, uh, to keep studying and thinking and proposing around that problem. So my, my commitment is to, to keep working. Uh, I have been very lucky to find some uh, incredible people in my own country uh, working on these uh, issues. Uh, I am very proud of the work that uh, we have done. I, I am, by the way, very proud of our more recent uh, uh, document that was written by uh, Catalina Perez Correa and Francisca Pou Jimenez, uh, where I think uh, we have now a holistic, comprehensive uh, argument uh, against the uh, violation of the Mexican Constitution uh, by the prohibition policy. They have uh, written a paper just recently, which is called Prohibitionist Drug Policy in Mexico, a Systemic Constitutional Underminer. And uh, it was just finished, and it was just admitted uh, for a publication in a very prestigious uh, law journal. Uh, and of course, that is just uh, an element, because I think we now have to socialize the analysis that they are producing. And actually, I just agree with uh, them and also with uh, Alejandro Madrazo and Fernanda Alonso, to retake our 2018 uh, project and updating it uh, in light of the new evidence and, and circumstances. Uh, so we will keep working. And this is, of course, from the Ivory Tower, where I have been now uh, for almost 20 years, university. People still say, now you are. No, this is, has been the most significant part of my professional career, almost 20 years here at the university. But from here, I will continue to support the course. Thanks to you, Kasia. Thanks very much. Stay safe, Ernesto. Bye-bye.